you have your Bible still open in Ruth, let's look back there and if you don't, you'll find it again. There, there is um, a lot in chapter 4 of, of Ruth that is very complicated and very complex and if you are um, interested in this and you have already looked at this a lot, uh, you will probably uh, you will probably note that there is a lot that we do not that I will not mention just because uh, of where I'm trying to go and and trying to uh, how I'm trying to get there. So I want to try to go through the entire chapter as a as an outline as a story just to kind of put that all together for you, and then at the end I want to put it all together as we not only finish the story, but then we also summarize the whole story. The, the, I think in the halfway down in your, in your bulletin there, in your notes there, it says, what's the significance of Ruth and this part of the story? So I want to try to accomplish both of those things together. Um, one of the things that I kept seeing as I was going through this is that there is so much um, legal, uh, a legal practice going on in this book that it doesn't make any sense. It's it's about as as um, as, un, as easy to understand as why she uncovered his feet and and, and all of that stuff. That, that as we looked at last week, what, what's the point? What's the what's the the meaning behind this? And and there's there's really there's two different aspects of the law that are being woven into this story. There is a there there's this um, aspect of the goel, uh, the redeemer of. Of, uh, of, of one thing, and then there's the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer, and, and there's basically we have someone redeeming land, and we have someone also perpetuating the name of the dead, and it's all being intertwined, and that a lot of that plays into the, the complexity of what we're going to look at in chapter 4. But we're not going to try to um, uh, explain it all together, and, and I don't, my, my, my plan is not to get you to walk out of here and, and, and be an expert in Jewish law, because... Uh, I would be the wrong teacher for that. So we're going to cover uh, really what I think is the main idea of this chapter, but also of the entire book. What's the point of this? Why is the book of Ruth there? Why is it in our Bible for us to see? Much of this uh, has to do with Jewish law and custom and tradition, and that has nothing to do with us today in the 21st century, but at the same time, there is plenty for us to see and I think once we get into it, you'll see where we're going. It's really uh, the same theme that we've carried throughout the, the, the entire book. We see in the very beginning here, we left off at Boaz. Uh, was uh, He had cold feet, uh, not before the marriage, but before the proposal. And that's what left uh, got him up to the proposal was his cold feet. And he uh, had promised Ruth, I will redeem you. And I have to just check. There's one little one little bump in this road, and that will be... Uh, there is someone closer to you in the family than I am. We don't know Boaz's exact relation to Naomi. Uh, he's going to call this uh, other kinsman, who uh, Scripture seems to just leave his name out. Uh, he calls him a brother, but I think that's more of a general term, like I would call you my brothers. I might call my, uh, like we, we have the band of brothers, World War II. They weren't all biologically related, but they were close. And I think that this that's, that's kind of his intent in calling him brother there. We don't know the kinsman, uh, this unnamed kinsman. We don't know how his relation to Naomi and, and Ruth is closer to Boaz, but we know that Boaz knows. And as I said last week, I think he's been plotting this. He's been, he sees this as a speed bump. He's woken, uh, he's woke up in the middle of the night and uh, he has uh, proposed uh, marriage. And he says, I would love to, but there's someone closer. I, I've been thinking about this. I don't know how I've gotten around this. He promises Ruth, I'm going to take care of this in the morning. You stay here in the morning. Uh, we saw last week, he got her up early. He said, go home. Don't let anybody know that, that a woman was at the threshing floor. Here, take six measures of, of barley and take this home to Naomi so that you don't go home without anything for her. And, and Naomi finishes the chapter telling Ruth, sit still, wait, and uh, this will not rest. This, uh, Boaz will not rest until the matter has been concluded today. From Boaz's statement, we gather that Ruth will find rest eventually. The question now is, will it be in the home or under the wing of Boaz or under the wing of this unnamed Redeemer? 
if you follow the story and you don't know what happened in chapter 4, you, you, you kind of find yourself rooting for Boaz, right? This is, uh, this is kind of like the, the fairy tale where you know, she meets Prince Charming, they fall desperately in love, but here's a bump, here's a problem, here's something going to keep them from, from a marriage, from being together, and it's this other person. And, and they have to decide how they're going to uh, do this. Are we going to sneak around the law? Are we going to uh, let the law uh, take its course and, and uh, potentially never be able to be together because of this, this, this one guy who's, in the, who's messing all of it up? And that's how we enter chapter 4. Boaz, first thing in the morning, he has left the threshing floor. Uh, Ruth has uh, gone home. And, and many, many, many would say that Ruth and Naomi actually made their way to this meeting because it involved Naomi. We don't know that for sure. But uh, we, we really don't see Ruth anymore in the rest of the story. She's mentioned, but she's not part of the story. She's just kind of there. And uh, until we see at the very end, she has, she has the baby. But um, this is really a Boaz's shining moment. This is really where we see Boaz, uh, the, the, the kinsman redeemer, uh, steps up and, and does some just amazing things. We see in the first 12 verses what I just called a confrontation. Boaz calls a meeting. First thing in the morning, he's in the city gate. This is where they would have done business and, and conducted this type of business. Uh, he, he called together. He, 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 he says, Ho, such a one. It's a weird way to, 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 to catch someone, especially if you knew it. Uh, I can't find his name anywhere except one place. Some guy decided he knew what his name was, and I can't even remember what it is, and I, I don't think it matters. In fact, I was just having a conversation uh, this morning, and I said, and I, I said you know, I I, can, I spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, and then I realize maybe there's a reason that, that the Bible's silent on that, because it, he's not a main character in the story. Uh, he's easily forgotten, and the only reason he's even mentioned is because he almost had a chance to redeem uh, Ruth. Uh, he says, uh, hey, sit down here, and he, and, he, and he does, and he gets the guy, and then he gets ten men of the elders of the city, and these would have been the, this would have been the custom, and this is how they would have conducted business. It was not unusual for business to be conducted in this place, in this area, and so this was not anything out of the out of the ordinary. But Boaz calls this meeting together. It starts off with twelve. Later on, it just says that there were witnesses there. I think it began to attract a crowd. Maybe Naomi was there with Ruth. We don't know for sure. And we get Boaz in verse number three begins to explain the situation. In verse three, he says, "Naomi, that has come again out of the country of Moab, sell the parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's." And I thought to advertise thee, saying, "Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people." If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. He says, Naomi is selling Elimelech's land. There's a little bit of confusion on it. Had she already sold it? Was she in the process of selling it? What's going on? Uh, one, of, one of the things that we do understand about, if you understand Levitical law and things, uh, that God owned all of the land, and He basically gave it to the children of Israel as their inheritance. It did not necessarily belong to them. They were the stewards of that land. And any time something happened where they ended up losing that land, there was a thing called the year of Jubilee, and everything got reset back to normal. So if you bought something that belonged, if you bought land that belonged to another family at the year of Jubilee, it went back to that family. And so it was, it was, a, it was, it was one of God's protections and provisions to make sure that the people, that the inheritance stayed with the people that, to whom it belonged. But uh, maybe Naomi sold it before she left. Maybe that was Elimelech's last dealing. Or maybe this is Naomi doing it now because she needs the, she needs the, uh, the money. Um, and so he, he brings it up. Hey, she's selling this land. And he says, hey, you've got Jeff. I, and Jeff has been the, 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 my go-to name for the last four or five weeks. So uh, this Elimelech, Elimelech's brother named Jeff. And uh, he, he says, hey, you've got the right to redeem this land. And I need you to know if you, if, I want to know if you're going to redeem it. You need to take care of this now. And if you don't, tell me because I'm next in line and I'm going to do it if you don't do it. And leaving it at that with just land, the man says, yeah, I'll do this. I, I, I want land. Who doesn't want more property? And uh, maybe he sees some, some familial obligation here to, to Naomi to take care of her, but the, there's, no, there's no reference to you got to marry Naomi or you got to marry Ruth. It's just, hey, do you want the land? And he says, yeah, I'll take the land. I'll, I'll, I'll buy the land. And then Boaz throws this little, this little curve in there. And Boaz, I think, is doing this very, very particularly and doing it in a specific way. Uh, and, and, and we won't go into all the details of why, but you do notice that he is, he is leaving Ruth out of it for the time being. He says there in verse number 5 then, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabites, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Now he throws that extra part in there. He says, all right, 
you're willing to redeem the land, here's the thing. The day that you do that, you're also obligated to buy the to, to buy uh, everything that besides the land that belonged to them. And part of that is this is this woman Ruth, the woman from Moab. And he brings it up here. And I think uh, maybe there was maybe there was some resentment there because of, of her nationality or whatever. And maybe he's using that to his advantage and saying, all right, I got you on the hook, but let me throw the thing out there that you probably aren't you weren't expecting and you're probably not wanting to do. You got to marry Ruth. Because you, you have an obligation to continue this family line. And this was that Leverett law where if a man died and he was married and he didn't have any children and that man's brother was obligated to marry his brother's wife and the first child that they had would carry the name and the inheritance of the dead, of, of the dead uh, brother. And uh, so we see that when he brings that up. Now, I don't think that either Boaz or this other kinsman were brothers, but uh, they were... They were uh, and so there's a lot of... Um, if you look at the, 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 the letter of the law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there, there's not an exact holding to the law in these, in these passages, uh, but there is a spirit of the law, if you will, that Boaz is following. And so he says, all right, you, you'd be obligated to marry Ruth if, if, this is the, uh, if that's what you want to do. And the man says, well, in verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself then, lest I mar or impair my own inheritance. I can't do this. Why would, why would this matter? Why can't you marry Ruth? Was Ruth that ugly? Was, I mean, was, she, was she that awful of a woman? I don't think so. Well, from what we've read up to this point, everybody in town loves Ruth. We've read several verses, at least one per chapter, that has something glowing to say about Ruth's reputation in the community. And yet, Bo, and, and yet this man says, I can't do it. And uh, one of the reasons would have been that uh, the possibilities here, if he had no other children, and then he had a child with Ruth, technically that child would belong to Elimelech or Malan, who is Ruth's wife, and if they had no other children, then all of his inheritance would end up being absorbed into Elimelech. So by trying to save this family line, he would have messed up his own family line. Another possibility would have been just the complications that if he did have other children, it would have messed everything up, just been complicated. And, and he says, I don't want to deal with this. I can't do this. He says, I cannot. Whether or not that means he's not able or he just doesn't want to, I will not. Uh, and I don't want to mess this all up. He says, I don't, I don't want to do it. He says, hey, take, this, take, take the right uh, for yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I back out. And so then the Bible stops here, and it kind of gives us a little bit of a traditional history lesson, which tells me that when the book of Ruth was written, this was not the, the going practice. And so the writer of Ruth not only has to tell us, because we don't do that, right? We don't, I don't want to carry some guy's shoe around. And my, my thought was, what do you do with the shoe? What did Boaz do with this guy's shoe? What do you do with one shoe? Have you ever gone to the store and you found a box with only one shoe in it? You're like, is there, is there a one-footed person walking around here? They only needed one. So did they get them half price? You know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to know, what does Boaz do? Does he stick it on the windowsill? Does he stick it in his office? Does he frame it? Because it, it was like the deed. It was the way that Boaz would have proven to everyone else, I, uh, no, I was not next in line to get it, but the guy that owned this shoe, it still smells of him, uh, he gave me the right, and it's, and, it's, and it's something similar to the fact that by giving you my shoe, I have no more right to step on that land. I have no right to walk on that and claim it as my own. I have a shoe. Now, I don't know how, why, that, you know, everyone probably wore, they probably didn't have name brand shoes back then either. So I don't know. Maybe they, they scribbled the guy's name in it at the bottom. I don't know what happened. But, you know, I have his Nike right here, and, and this, this proves that I, have, I, I much prefer the, the paper deeds that we use today. But they gave a little history lesson there, because probably when the book was, was written, this practice was not as common, and so therefore needed an explanation. But that's what happened. He says, uh, here, take the shoot. And if you read, it's discussed in Levitical law as well. They were actually, the, the, the widow uh, was supposed to get the shoe, and she was supposed to spit in his face, saying, you would not care for the family. You, you would rather... Uh, Give me your shoe, then take care of the, the, your family. You spit in face. We don't see that. And really, we don't even see this guy becoming a bad guy. So that's why I say the letter of the law is not completely followed as much as the spirit of the law. But uh, we see that Boaz becomes the redeemer. And yay, we've been hoping for this, right? I mean, if you didn't know what was going to happen, you're like, oh man, oh, Boaz gets this. Why isn't, he, why aren't they, why isn't uh, uh, this working out the way it's supposed to? And finally, we see that it works. And, and we really begin the happy ending now. We really begin to see uh, the, the, the last fight in the movie or the last uh, antagonist in the book has been removed. And now this is beginning a conclusion of a very, very happy ending. Boaz becomes the redeemer. He tells the witnesses there, the, at least the original ten elders that were there and probably more people as they went around. He goes, all right, I have a shoe. You guys see it? This is Jeff's shoe right here. 
And this is, uh, this is the proof that I'm buying the land. Not only am I buying the land, I'm buying Ruth to be my wife as well. And the witnesses give a very particular blessing. We're going to uh, look at these two different blessings from the witnesses and then also from the ladies uh, uh, after the baby is born. Look with me there, please, in verse number, uh, verse number 11. And it says, All the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is coming to thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which two did build the house of Israel. Now, what does this have to do with the blessing? What does that mean? Be like Rachel and Leah. Well, if you know your Bible from Genesis, Rachel and Leah were the official matriarchs of the nation of Israel. They were the two women that bore the 12 sons that we understand are the 12 tribes of Judah. They began with barrenness and God made them fruitful. Remember, uh, Rachel was the beloved. Leah was the sister that was first married, and she had the preeminence. She was also actually the mother of Judah, which is from whom uh, the Messiah would come. But it says that Rachel was loved more than Leah was. Jacob had a favorite wife, and, and uh, Leah was, uh, was, was not, able, uh, not able to win her husband's affection. So God blessed her by giving her children, but Rachel could have no children. And finally, we see weird things going on with these two sisters as they're bartering for each other, and they're, they're, there's, a, there's a competition who can have the most babies and with, with the same husband. And, and, there's this, and, and they finally stop at, at 12 plus a few girls, and there's just, there's just, uh, there's, it goes from extreme barrenness to fruitfulness. And so the, not only is that is a, is, a, is a blessing of many, many children, uh, they're also saying here to, uh, to Boaz from Ruth, may she begin to have the, the, the prominence of, this, uh, of these two matriarchs of our family. May, may, she, be, um, may she be like Re Rachel and Leah uh, uh, being held in high esteem in the uh, Jewish matriarchy. Then they give another blessing. They say there at the, at the next part there, it says, and do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. This is a typical of a Jewish blessing that they make a statement and then the next statement expands upon the previous statement. Ephrata is pretty much the same as Bethlehem. It's the, it's the, it's the Ephrata would be the clan and then Bethlehem was the actual city there. And they're saying, uh, do worthily be, and then be famous in Bethlehem. And, and, and this is a, this is a blessing there that, that, um, that, that they would, that they would see, a. uh, uh they would, they would, they, this would be a name that would, that would go on forever. It was just a, you know, you know be, be famous in Israel. Now, Boaz was already kind of famous in Bethlehem. Uh, but but there, it's a blessing on this family line uh, for, for fame and for uh, worthy reputations and things. And then it says there in, verse, in the next part, it says, and uh, let your house, verse 12, let your house be like the house of Therese or Perez, uh, from whom Tamar bare unto Judah. This is another weird skeleton in the in the Israel, uh, the, 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 what we're going to see is the royal family, the royal family history, that uh, Judah, one of the original 12 tribes, he had a son who married a daughter named Tamar. That son died. They had no children. So Leverett Law was supposed to be that the next son would take him, and he did not. He would not. Uh, and so God killed him. And then uh, there, was a, there was another, I think his name was Sheila, but he was too... That's, that's funny. But uh, Sheila's a girl's name, but he had a, he had a boy. But anyways, uh, Sheila was too young to be married. And so what Judah said was, he said, Tamar, go back to your father's house and wait. And when my son Sheila is old enough, uh, then he will marry you. That was the responsibility that Judah had. Well, he, Sheila grew up and he was not given to, uh, Tamar was not given to him in marriage. And so Tamar decided to, to um, trek Judah. She, she went to a city. She dressed herself like a prostitute and slept with Judah. Had a son. You read about it in Genesis. Uh, they had, she got pregnant. Judah finds out, hey, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been playing a harlot. She's pregnant. And Judah said, bring her here so that she can be killed because he, he felt that she had sinned. And so uh, she brought him here. Well, Tamar, one of the things that she had done was she said, as a promise of a payment for, for being with me, uh, I want something in return from you. And he said, here's my staff and my ring and, and I can't remember something else. And so when... Judah brings her forth to have her killed. She goes, well, these are the man. These are the father of the baby. These, these belong to the father of the baby. And Judah realizes that they're his. And he says, okay, never mind. Don't kill her. Uh, and this is Paris. She was pregnant with twins. And that's who Perez or Perez was. was one of these twins from this, uh, from this uh, uh, very uh, uh, embarrassing 
uh, mark in, in Israel's history. And they're, and they're saying, but he became this, this, uh, this, this prominent name within this, this time frame. And uh, we see here that the genealogy is going to start with him in verse number 18. But they says, let, let, him be, let, uh, let him be like the house of Pharaohs and uh, the seed which the Lord give thee. And, and, and it must have been that there was a, a lot of prominence and, and success and wealth from this particular family line. And that was one of their, their ancestors. And so they're, they're blessing on there. And so with this blessing, Boaz in verse number 13 takes Ruth to be his wife. They have a child. And uh, it just things just keep getting better and better. Now, Excuse me. Verse number fourteen begins with a second blessing, and this is uh, what we see here: um, marriage and baby. And I like how it says here that in verse number uh, verse number thirteen, it says that the Lord gave her conception, and, and, and it, it's showing us here how God uh, specifically interact uh, intervened or interacted into their lives and uh, gave them a baby. Some some suggest that Ruth was barren and she could have no children, and now God did something special with her. We we don't have any. Specific proof of that, it could have been that Malan uh, could not have children, and now Ruth uh, has it. But we see that God comes in and God uh, gives them a baby. God has been very active, both behind the scenes and at the forefront in the life of Ruth, in the life of Naomi, in the life of Boaz, and, and all around Bethlehem. We sang about Bethlehem this morning. Uh, and, and, and all of these things are happening in this little town of Bethlehem, and we see God is active even to the very end, and, and the writer is very careful to, re- to recognize the fact that God did this. God gave, God, God gave them a son. And so the women of the town come to Naomi. Remember the last time the women of the town met Naomi as they were coming into Bethlehem? And they said, is this Naomi? She's changed. She looks so different. Naomi means sweet and pleasant, and, and, and she doesn't look sweet and pleasant anymore. And, and Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I left full and I came back empty and God is against me and the hand of God has been against me. Well, over the past couple of months, Naomi's bitterness has been, has been uh, dismissed and, and hope has begun to spring in her heart. And now we see here that Naomi takes center stage with this baby. She's not the mom. She didn't do anything except be there to help take care of the baby, but they're actually treating the baby as if it belongs to Naomi herself. Notice verse 14. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. What are they saying there? Well, first thing they're saying is, Blessed be God, who's not left you without a redeemer. And this is the exact opposite, very contrary to what we, I just explained to you what happened in verse 19 of chapter 1 when she said, oh, God has been against me. God has, has emptied me of everything. And they're saying, God hasn't left you without a redeemer. God has been good to you. And God has, has definitely led you some interesting twists and turns in your life. But God has been good to you. And God has not forgotten you. And God has not been against you. And God has given you this kinsman redeemer. Now, he is not going to be able to take care of Naomi. Very good chance that Naomi will be dead before this baby girl is old enough. Naomi already felt she was too old to remarry. I don't know how old that is, but in Naomi's mind, she was near the end of her life, and this baby was not going to grow up and take care of, uh, take care of her. But in a sense, this was the one that, that proved the fulfillment that God had not forsaken them, that God had not abandoned them. This new life, this new family, a part of her family is going to continue this line of, and, and their family will not be forgotten in Israel. And that's what they say there at the end of verse 14. He had not left thee today without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. It's not speaking of the Lord here. I, I think it's speaking of the, of the, of the little boy. Very different. Uh, and it's a little bit expanded from what happened uh, in the blessing in verse 11 when uh, the, the, the men of the city said, uh, be famous and do worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Small goals. And now the lady said, he's going to be famous in all Israel. No longer just the little tiny town of Bethlehem, but the whole nation of Israel. They go, they go on with their, 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 their blessing and they say, uh, he will be a restorer of your life and a nourisher in your old age. He's going to bring new life to you. 
You're not going to be this bitter old cranky woman. You're going to, you're going to have new, 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 new goals. New, you have hope, a future. And much the way that we, that when we have that, the baby and you hold the baby in your arms and we think about the potential that this little one has and the future that awaits this little one and, and all the, the, the hopes and dreams that are wrapped up in a little tiny baby and they're, 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 they're looking at Obed and they're, and they're, and they're, they're, they're thinking about all of the, the potential and the future that this little baby has. But then they realize, Naomi, You've got something to live for. God has blessed you. Those children were a sign that God had blessed them. It was a sign that God was not against them. And Naomi is holding the very thing that proves that God is not against her. And the ladies recognize that. But then they say they're in, they have a very unique blessing of Ruth. And I like this. And we're not going to, I'm going to mention it. We're not going to dwell on it. But there are some questions at the end if, if you'd like to look at those uh, as for homework, I guess. But they, they make this statement about Ruth, and I, and I love this, what it says there. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And number seven is, is symbolic in Hebrew uh, uh, for perfection, for completion. And they're saying to her that having Ruth in your family is better to you than having seven sons, than having this perfect, complete family. Ruth, that's all you had. Before there was Boaz, before there was Obed, there was Ruth. And when it was just you, the widow woman, and Ruth, you had it. I mean, Ruth was that valuable. Ruth was that wonderful to you. Ruth was that caring and that loving. And they said, Ruth has done this for you. And Ruth has blessed you in many more ways than you can think of. And they go on and says that Naomi, and, and Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom became nursed to it. She became the nanny, if you will. And uh, began and held the baby, but this is Naomi embracing this role of grandma. And from this verse, we see that the the last remnants of the bitterness have finally begun to have finally left. And Naomi is is back to being Naomi again. Naomi's back to she's grandma Naomi now, and she is she is embracing this role of I am not done. Uh, my purpose is not done on this earth. I've got more to do. And she begins to take a prior, uh, take a, a, an interest in raising and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, investing into this child, Obed. And it says in verse peculiar, verse 17, that the women named the baby. It seems like that at least. That this, is not a, this is not the normal practice. And I think that uh, this is not any different than the custom. But the way it says it seems to, seems to kind of lead us in a different direction. But it says the women or neighbors gave it a name saying, uh, there's a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. Now, it begins an interesting uh, genealogy here. It says, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, Hezron, Ram, Ram, Aminadab, Aminadab, Nashon, Nashon, Salmon, Salmon, Boaz. Boaz begat Obed, Obed, Jesse, Jesse, David. Now, what is all this? What's this for? Why well, finish a, a Matthew starts his book with a genealogy, and he does a whole chapter full. And really, if you've ever tried to read you know, like devotional reading and you get to chapter 1, and you really start off trying to pay attention about two verses, and then you're just reading. And the way that it is, is begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, or father so-and-so, father so-and-so, and you're just done. All right, what did I get out of that? Really, it's, it's, it's very important that both Matthew and Luke and even this genealogy that we find in Ruth is very helpful here. But from this disaster, from this personal bitter tragedy that it was experienced by the Elimelech family. We see, and this genealogy gives us proof, from this tragedy, from disaster, came the greatest king of Israel. We see David, and that's why it ends with David. And I think it was the, 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 the writer uh, takes great pains to make sure that people understand, from this family came King David, who had a, uh, a Jericho prostitute, in his tree. He had a Moabites, uh, a foreigner in his family tree. He has someone like Tamar, who is Jewish, but she is of questionable character as well in his family tree. And here's King David. Now, here's, here's, where, here's where I want to go with this. What is the significance of, of Ruth, of the whole book, to me, to you, 21st century? What is the significance of this specific part of the story? First, I have to say that to the Jews, because this, this, was, this was written, not specifically to me, but, but it was written uh, to the, the readers of this time. Here we see for the Jews that this is an ancestral trace to their greatest king of Israel. 
to their greatest king, which is King David. And the book of Ruth here shows that God specifically inserted a Gentile into the Jewish royal line. Specifically, actually, there were two, uh, uh, Rahab and, and Ruth, that were specifically in, inserted into this Jewish family tree. And not just any family, the royal family, the greatest family of them all. Uh, there were Gentiles and skeletons in that closet. They remember, we study, we study all throughout, um, the Jews are proud of their heritage. The Jews are proud of their, of their family and their, and their separation from the Gentiles. And, and we see many times in the Gospels and in the New Testament how the Jews would take great pains to not have anything to do with the Gentiles. And, and very, very separated. But here, they are in the family. And they are not, they are not just uh, sidestepped here or just brushed over. These are great, um, pivotal uh, matriarchs in the family tree. We also see here that because of this, that God is not a respecter of persons and that He uses whomever He chooses, whether pious Jews or pagan Gentiles, to accomplish His will. God does what God wants to do. If God wants to use Jews, God will use Jews. If God wants to use Gentiles, God will use Gentiles. If God wants to use a prostitute, God will use a prostitute. If God wants to use a priest, He'll use a priest. That's what it is for the Jews. And that's why we see up to this point, it is read up to King David. But for us, we know that that story goes further, right? What's the significance of King David? So that we have a bunch of Psalms to read? No. So that we have some stories to tell our kids in Sunday school about Goliath and, 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 and things like that? No. We recognize the significance of King David as be, because later on, there is going to be a greater king of kings and God used King David to write and prophesy about this coming king, the greater king, and we see that in this as we, as we read it. Uh, there are certainly uh, many tips and principles that we can find in, in, in examples such as Ruth that we can model our lives. We met, took some time last week and looked at Boaz and we looked at Ruth and different things about, uh, about them and, and qualities and characteristics. And there, certainly we can, we can glean little truths and tidbits uh, from these things. Ruth's reputation, Boaz's character, how to deal with bitterness and, and, and so on. But as we see that, I think the uh, an overall or a more uh, a more priority, uh, a higher priority uh, to this story here is that it's more than tracing a family tree to King David. It is tracing it all the way to Jesus Christ. The Bible and all, and all the specifically the Old Testament stories. The Bible is not another form of Aesop's fables. You know what Aesop's fables are? They're short little stories, cute little endings, and they have a moral. Uh, this is more than an ancient form of chicken soup for the soul. I think sometimes we look at the Bible that way. I've got these stories, and I'm going to pull these little, these little cute things out, and oh, that not that nice? And that's why we have the stories of the Bible, so that I can read something, I can not be bored, and I can learn a little something along the way. Really, the Bible is so much more than that. From Genesis to Revelation, the purpose of the book of Ruth and every biblical narrative is to reveal to us the God of the Bible and reveal to us how that God accomplishes His will. And Ruth plays a very important role in that as we see the scarlet thread, if you will, going from Genesis all the way to Revelation and leading up to Christ and after Christ has ascended to heaven, how Christ continues to work. It's all about God. The, the, the hero of every story in the Bible is God. The character of every story in Scripture is God. And so as we read it, we don't want to get distracted by focusing on Boaz or focusing on Ruth or focusing on Obed or Jesse or David. We look at the God of these people and we look at what God did in these people's lives. And so with that in mind, let me uh, finish this morning our study, but also the book with three, um, uh, three pra applications, if you will, three observations. Number one, I, just call, I call it just a part of the story. Ruth had a baby. We see that from this passage here. Ruth had a baby, and a baby whose name is Obed. That's great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. And that baby led to King David, and that's awesome, and that's wonderful too. Who would have dreamed that, that, this, that this, uh, this former widow who had, at the beginning of chapter, or at the end of chapter 1, had resigned herself to, widow, to, to a life of widowhood. She's a young woman. And she had decided, I imagine Ruth, every time I read it, I imagine Ruth in her 20s. And she committed to Naomi saying, I will be with you where you go, I'll go where you lodge, I'll lodge. I will die with you. And after you die, I will stay there because where you're buried, I will be buried. There's no prospect. Naomi has made that very clear. I have no more sons. You're going into a foreign land. They don't want you there. 
They're not going to marry you. You're, you're a sweet girl, Ruth, but you're from the wrong country. You got born in the wrong place. And it's the only thing against you. You've got no future, no hope. And that's why Naomi said, go back to your family. She said, no, I'm not going to do that. And that was Ruth saying, I commit to a life of poverty. I commit to a life of loneliness. If, if Naomi dies in the next few years, she's going to be a young woman with absolutely nobody, and she's committed to sticking it out anyway. Who would have thought that that girl would have given birth to a son that would eventually lead to the greatest king Israel has ever seen? Who would have thought that that woman would have given birth to a child that would eventually lead to the Messiah? It's just another part of the story. And here's the thing. That story isn't over. It's Christmas time. We're thinking about the one moment in history when God came, He took on flesh, and He became like us, and He lived among us, and He lived, and He came in the most unassuming way, in the most unintimidating way, and He became like one of us. And he lived among us, and he died for uh, he died for sin, and, and all these things. But that's not the end of the story. When we get to when we get to the spring, and we celebrate Easter, and we celebrate that that little baby grew up, and that little baby lived a life that was pure and clean and perfect, and ended up uh, hanging on a cross and dying, and, and in his dying words, forgiving the very people who put him up there. That's not the end of the story. The baby. They grew up, that died on the cross, was put into the tomb. And three days later, the baby that grew up, that died on the cross, was put into the tomb, rose again, and lives today. And that's not the end of the story because you and I are part of that story. And every person who has been touched by Christ and by the truth of the gospel is a part of that story. Now, you're not in the bloodline of, of Ruth. You're not, we're not in the bloodline of David. We're not saying that. But we're a part of that story. When we read Ruth, we see part of my story a long time ago. And as I read as I read the Christmas story in just a couple of weeks, and I sit around with my family, we'll read Luke 2 or Matthew if we're really in a hurry, or maybe even just a short prophecy verse in Isaiah because we really want to get to the present. We're going to read and we're going to think about, we're going to think about the story and realize this is my story. Because my story is not complete without Christ. And how did that all get to be? Because of what happened in Ruth. Because of what happened in Bethlehem. Number two, we see the joy of a baby. Now, Obed's birth brought great joy to one family in one tiny little town. But the story, as I said, isn't about Obed. The story isn't about David. The story is about Jesus. The story, at least one of the things that we get from this, is that this story introduces us to a little town called Bethlehem. We're, we're very familiar with Bethlehem, aren't we? Not because of its size, not because of its great importance in economy and industry, but because of Jesus. It's really the only reason that Bethlehem is known. It's the city of David. It's just a little town, as we say, a little town of Bethlehem. Tiny, insignificant. The prophets even said, though you're small and insignificant, there's a plan, there's a purpose for you story that introduced us to a little town would later welcome a child to silence and anonymity. That birth would bring more joy than to just one family, or to just one little town. He's saying joy to the world. Obed brought joy to a family. The angel said, we bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The joy of the birth of a baby. And last, maybe to summarize all of it, what God will do. You never know what God is going to do, do you? Now you read the Scriptures and you see, oh, okay, I know what God is going to do. I, I've read this part before. When we look at our own lives, when we look even at some of the parts of the Scripture, we go, what are you doing there, God? Why, why are you doing that? Why, why, why are you doing things in my life? Why are you doing that? I like this. Daniel Block said, Indeed, God has a habit of surprising us with those whom He chooses to carry out His mission. We read the stories of Scripture and we see, you use so-and-so to do that? 
You use that person to do that? I mean, Jesus, when you started your ministry, why didn't you get like 12 Pauls? Because, man, from a human perspective, what would it have been like if there were like 12 Apostle Pauls from the very beginning doing the work? You pick fishermen. You pick guys who were too afraid to stand up and, and acknowledge that they were part of your crew. You pick guys who ran away from you. Why would you choose them? Why would you choose me? Why did you choose us? There's nothing that remarkable, that special about me. Why did you choose me? Life doesn't always turn out as we plan. But God accomplishes His will through both the good and the bad in our lives. We can trust that God is good and just, and that God is in control and that He cares about us. We're more than just pieces on a little chessboard that God has in heaven, and God is moving you here simply because you're just a pawn in the game. And we're nothing special. But I don't, I don't believe through the, through the eyes of Scripture that God sees us as nothing more than just a piece the puzzle. I don't even, I'm not even good enough to be a piece of the puzzle. And yet God has graciously invited me into this plan. Not only that do I get to serve Him, but God actually cares about me. God actually cares what I'm going through. Peter says, I cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. That's the God that we serve. This is the God of the story of Peter. And I don't know what God is going to do. I don't know what God is doing in your life right now. But we do learn from stories like these. Whatever it is, it will be good and glorious. I learned that there's a place for me. I learned that in the end, whatever God will do is better than anything that I had. Anything that I could have planned. I've got a good imagination. But as I read these stories, I can remind me God can do infinitely better than anything I can do. John Piper said, Ruth was written to give us encouragement and hope that all the perplexing turns in our lives are going somewhere good. He continues, that God is not showing up after the trouble and cleaning it up. He is plotting the course and managing the troubles with far-reaching purposes for our good for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what Ruth is for. It's to, for me to sit and read and realize if God can use a Gentile thorn in, the, in one of the most significant parts of the royal line, why couldn't he use it? If God can take these people and bring these people who really had nothing to do with each other. If, if Elimelech and Naomi had, had done what every good Jew should have done, they would have never left and gone to Moab, which means Ruth would have never made their way to Bethlehem. If the kinsman redeemer who was closer than Boaz would have stepped up and did his part and said, I will do what, what, is, was, was, what is good to do. I will take Ruth. How would that have changed? And yet above all the things that we see that we of the choices that people make in life, we see God. Is it going? Oof! How am I going to fix that? God is above all of that. God sees the end and the beginning all at the same time, and God says, "I'm all the things that are happening to you in your life. They look confusing and they're frustrating and they're hard to understand. You know, when your kid's sick and you can't do anything about it." We were we've been we spent some time in the hospital later and, uh, and recently and I was telling my wife recently I said one of the one of the jobs that I think would be one of the hardest jobs to have is to be a nurse or a doctor for a pediatric because I don't think I could live every day dealing with little babies who are hurting and suffering and dying and watching their parents helpless to do anything to help their baby and at the point when the doctors have said we can't do anything. There's only so much we can do. The baby can't tell us where it hurts. The baby can't, the baby can't communicate to us. And I, when those types of things happen in our lives and we say, God, what is going on? God, this doesn't make any sense. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. 
I'm, I'm obeying, I'm trusting, I'm following, but it looks like you're leading us to a dead end. It looks like you're taking me into the water. Remember Israel? When they followed the pillar, they followed Moses out of Egypt, and where did he lead them? To the water. And he, he backed them up with an army. And there was nowhere for them to go. And that's what it feels like sometimes following Christ. God, what are you doing? Do you, did you not see the big giant sea over there and you led us to it? And then all of a sudden, it really, because that's the attitude we have, we deserve for God to say, no, I had something better. And because you want to be a little stink about it. That's not what he did, did he? Remember the Israelites are going, we're going back. God says, no, 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 hold on. We move some of this water out. That would have been so cool to see. An aquarium. They walk through the aquarium. Sticking your hand in there. And then the Egyptians, what did they do? What would you have done if you were an Egyptian? I don't think I'm going that way. That's weird. But they did. And then realizing what all of us would have been worried about, I wonder how long these walls are going to hold up. Oh, done. When we think that we've come to the end, when God takes us on these really long curves, uh, that book I was reading, I've quoted several times that John Piper wrote, he, he talked about how we think that our life should be a straight line from here to there. From coast to coast, straight line, beeline, and yet... God takes us through the mountains and God takes us around things and he goes through things and it's, and it's a long and winding course but it always gets there at just the right time, just the right place, every single time without fail. We learn to trust God by reading stories like this, by reading Ruth, by reading about Boaz and Naomi, we read any of the stories. We read God knows what he's doing. And God can take you through whatever path that He has chosen for you. God will not get to some point and go, oh, I didn't see that one coming. I've never dealt with this one before. No, you've never dealt with it before. And I've never dealt with it before. And maybe none of us in this room, we could sit around and scratch our heads going, I don't know. And that's often what, what I feel like when I sit in people's hospital rooms or sitting beside a, a bed and why am I here? I don't know. What's God doing? I don't know. There's no verse. I said last week, there's so many decisions we have to make in life that there aren't verses for. Why does the bad stuff happen to the good people and the seemingly bad people get the good stuff? I don't know. But when I read Ruth, I realize that God knows. He didn't tell me at all, but He knows. He knows what He's doing. I just... Okay, I'm going to trust. I'm going to do what it is that I think I'm supposed to do here. I said last week, I'm going to take a step. If you don't want me to step there, stop me. If I really want what you want, I don't want to go this way, but nothing else looks right. Imagine when, when God told Moses, all right, I want you to go straight. No, there's water there, God. Just go straight. Several times, he didn't have them part the water until they stepped in it. Then it parted. Go. Trust me. What are you talking about? It's water there. We can't swim. They're holding an ark on there. <laughs> Back what are we? As soon as they took that first step, go. But it didn't happen until they stepped. What are what are what is God doing in your life? I don't know. But I know that God knows. I know that if you trust him and you follow him. He'll take you where He wants you to go. And it probably won't be where you want it to go. But it'll be better. I guarantee that. Because the Word promises that over and over and over again. It is exactly what He wants you to do. Simply follow.